Hello YouTubers, this is the Nubifier, and welcome to a look behind the scenes. If you're a regular subscriber, you'll already know that I've taken what some might see as an excessive interest in my channel's audio. When I become interested in something, it's very normal for me to sink a bunch of time into research. It's part of my desire to get a functional understanding. I like knowing how and why something works, what makes it special, and when you might choose it over another. Today we're going to explore the concept of a diminishing return. A diminishing return is the point where to achieve smaller and smaller gains, your effort or cost spikes exponentially. You can see diminishing returns in almost anything in your day-to-day -day life from the food you eat, your tech, or where you live. A very simple example could be the sound difference between a dollar store earbud and the ear pods that you get for free with an iPhone. There's a night and day difference in the clarity, quality, and range. You'll also see a pretty big improvement by jumping from those ear pods to a set of mid-high range closed back headphones. The range and overall quality of the more expensive listening experience is very plain to detect and even a novice listener will notice the difference. The diminishing return threshold is personal and usually near the reasonable sweet spot between cost and value. When chasing that higher than standard fidelity, the listener requires increasingly exotic or specialized equipment. When you continue to push closer to perfection, it also becomes harder for the novice to notice the subtle differences. When I started making YouTube content for Star Citizen on the 10th of December 2015, I bought a USB Blue Yeti mic for about $100. Compared to the boom mic that came on my Logitech G35, the Yeti was the largest jump I've ever gained in my audio quality. Better than my home studio and better than any piece of hardware that I've purchased since. It's quite funny actually that that was also the least expensive upgrade. A truly impressive and versatile mic for the money. If you're planning on podcasting, streaming, or just to get a better sound in Discord, the Yeti gets my endorsement. The improved range of the Yeti mic made it more difficult to control the background noises. Unwanted sounds became much easier to detect in the recorded audio. So early on to deal with the noise, I boxed in my mic with foam until eventually I decided to build the home studio. I added a pop filter to cut down on aspirated plosives, which are the heavy P sounds. I also added an isolator, which suspends the microphone indirectly from the boom. The Yeti pop filter and ring shock mount are each about the same price as the microphone itself, which proves how good of a value it is. At this point I had a clean recording environment, an isolated microphone and a functioning pop filter. So why would I upgrade, and what would that upgrade be? My two goals were a warmer sound and an even wider dynamic range. When you start to get into higher quality gear, you usually reduce the resting hiss at the sound floor. This might not really be noticeable to the listener unless everything is absolutely dead silent. It's possible to counter the hiss with what's called a noise gate. After researching a lot and speaking with other content creators, I selected a Shure SM7B. It's a condenser type microphone which are known for fantastic audio reproduction and their ability to capture voice while rejecting ambient noises. In essence, if I didn't already have an isolated studio, a condenser microphone would reduce the ambient noises for the recordings. The differences between the USB Yeti and the Shure are very noticeable to me, but I wouldn't expect that the viewer would even notice. That's the most important factor about diminishing returns. The value threshold is personal. My pauses between spoken words now introduce even less background hiss. My overall quality and dynamic range are a true representation of my voice. The Yeti plugs directly into USB with no extra special equipment required. The industry standard for microphones uses a balanced set of wires known as XLR. For an XLR mic to work with a computer, you'll also need an amp with a processor that outputs to USB. When choosing an amp, you're going to need to consider how much gain the mic is going to need to bring it to line level. Most condenser mics are going to require plus 50 or plus 60 dB of gain to bring the signal up to a usable strength. Some combinations of microphones and amps won't be able to achieve that line level by themselves. You might need an extra piece of equipment between them known as a preamp. The preamp takes phantom power from the amp and uses it to boost the signal. The preamp quality is as critical as any other component. If you skimp anywhere in the chain, you'll introduce noise that will ruin your results. You need to balance the quality of your gear to get the best results. If you have an $800 mic paired with a $25 amp on $5 cables, you might as well go get the $100 Yeti. I'll sum up by giving you a rundown of the gear that I selected and why I selected it over other options. So I recommend any of the gear I'm about to list because if it wasn't working for me, I would have replaced it by now. The mic boom that I was using with the Yeti didn't need an upgrade. It's a Rode PSA-1 which are very common within the industry and are about $100.
They're about four times more expensive than the common newer brand, which are also available on Amazon. The more expensive road arm can support more weight without falling and always stays exactly where you put it. I've had mine for over a year and I've never had any problems with it. The microphone is a Shure SM7B, which is about 550. It's also very common and used by an army of fellow podcasters and streamers. It's also widely accepted as a vocal studio mic within the recording industry. The SM7B has an air suspension so you don't need to buy an isolator and it naturally includes a pop filter. All those factors plus the feedback I got from WTF Asaurus, Detox TV, Red Lear, Brickyard 44 and Sergeant Gamble assured me that this would be a no-brainer. For the amplified USB interface, I selected a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 which is about $150. If I streamed on Twitch, I would have likely opted for something more like a Behringer USB mixer. The mixer has the inputs needed to blend more sources, such as guests, music, in-game audio, and even more computers. The Focusrite 2i2 is a two-channel amp with lag-free monitor channel, RCA outputs, and a solid track record. If I needed to, I could use the second channel for very basic streaming in the future. The mic and amp paired together very well, generating a clean signal, but it was very weak. The amp gain needed to be maxed out to pull the very low signal from the microphone. I bought a cloud lifter preamp which added a clean 20 dB of inline gain. This let me unload the amp down to about 80%, plus I could move slightly further away from the mic. That helped a lot with the plosive P sounds, resulting in a more natural sound. So now that I've used it for a couple weeks, it's very clear to me that the upgrade was the right mix of components. Even though it may seem expensive for some, I don't feel that I cross too deep into the range of diminishing returns. I love the improved audio quality, it's a pleasure to use, and it's part of my drive to ensure the best quality for my subscribers. Please ask any questions you may have. I would love it if you could offer some personal experience, and please offer opinions if you have any. Thank you very much for spending your time with me, and I hope that you enjoyed this look behind the scenes. If you know someone who's starting out, please send them a link to this video. Fly safe, and I'll see you in the verse.